Gilbert, thank you to Rav Shiner for, for allowing me to come here and talk about this because and, and, and special, right? so a lot of people were involved in this really amazing, uh, really wonderful. Because this is the first time that I'm going to be talking about this. I've talked about Chelot many, many, many times. Baruch Hashem, I've been involved with Chelot now for 30 years. Just about 30 years, 1991. And I've had the opportunity to... Uh, learn many, many, many things about Chayot, not even a tiny little fraction of what there is still to learn, but uh, many, many interesting hours, hours spent. But this is the first time that I'm going to be talking about Chayot from a little bit of a different aspect, the aspect of the feel of the And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. I actually have one here, Bezrat Hashem, God will wear this Me'il, uh, hopefully, could be, soon. But we'll talk about that later. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, who's taping this? Can I can I get a copy afterwards? I don't know if to tape it. Perfect. So that was going to take this. I need to get the So the way we're going to do this is a little bit. Uh, maybe let's say f- ten minutes of a video, which is going to give a very very broad introduction to the world of Chaylas in general, the way we believe that it's uh, that the story is told. And obviously, I'm one person, I have my opinion, I have my approach. I don't want to be dogmatic. I don't want to tell you that this is the only way that you can look at things. And certainly, there are many, many other uh, uh, people who have studied this and have different attitudes and different ideas. This is the way that I see things. And, uh, and uh, hopefully, you'll, you'll at least, after you, uh, after you leave here, you'll at least understand why I feel this way. Say that. Why many, many people, I'm not important, but there are many, 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 many people who are wearing uh, trailers today from all over. I'll let you know the secret. Don't tell anybody. We just uh, shipped 50 sets of trailers to Monroe. So, <laughs> anyway, we'll see. But anyway, uh, uh, what we're going to do is a short, short video which will introduce the whole idea of, of, of trailers and the chilazo. Uh, and then I'm going to do the dying, but we'll do the dying tzamun, inside, together with the Gemara, just like Rosh Hashanah Yehuda told us. And that we'll do together. And then afterwards, I want to move the whole discussion to the Me'il, to the halachos that we learn, halacha lemaisa. We mamish learn halachos today from the Me'il. Quite a number of places where we argue with her at dinner of Gershon Henoch, not just on his identification of the snail, but on the halachos that he brought down, I hope you'll understand our position, the position of Silk Chaylas, that's the organization that, that, that I represent, and the organization that made Chaylas. Okay, so what we're going to do now, if, uh, if it's okay with everybody, let's just start with a, with, a, with a very, very brief overview. That way I don't have to talk anymore, but you can all uh, hear it together. I hope that you'll be able to hear it. About 4,000 years ago, just around the time of Abraham Avinu, on the Mediterranean island of Crete, some brilliant man or woman made an incredible discovery. The sea snails found along their coast, it seems, could be used to produce luxurious dye of wool. And these purple and blue dyes were not only beautiful, they were also extremely fast. They didn't fade or wash out. This discovery literally changed the world. Up until that time, you basically wore whatever the sheep decided, maybe a dull gray or off-white. Here and there, one found dyes made from roots or flowers, but they were always yellow, brown, or red. Purple? Blue? That was unheard of. And so, pretty soon, all over the Mediterranean, people wanted to wear the fabrics dyed from these amazing snails. The purple was called argaman, or argaman, and the blue, takiltu, or tachayla. Our neighbors to the north, the Phoenicians, were the greatest producers and traders of the dyes, and sent their fleets to the far reaches of the Mediterranean, setting up colonies to collect and process the snails they called porphyra. The Gemara uses the word chilazon, and the modern term is murex. Demand for the shellfish dye fabric soared, and so did the price. At one time, Trelas and Argaman were worth up to 20 times their weight in gold. Wearing clothes made of these fabrics was the ultimate status symbol, reserved for the most wealthy, for kings and queens. Even in faraway Persia, the Megillah tells us, Mordechai went out and went far, and Trelas and Argaman were but their purpose was not to boast of one's status or wealth. Rather, they were meant to be sanctified. The news in the avoda of the Melech Malchei Avrochim. They traded the walls and coverings of the Mishkan. Goigodo wore 
Marcus Trellis was generally not accepted outside his close circle. He died in 1891, having witnessed his lifelong dream with thousands of his chassidim wearing Trellis straight on their tongues. In 1914, Rabbi Yitzhak Isaac Halevi Herzog, who would later become the first chief rabbi of the state of Israel, entered the discussion, writing a comprehensive doctrine on the topic. As part of that work, he tested the Rebbe's intimus and determined that the Rebbe's procedure for obtaining the blue dye relied primarily on the chemicals that were added, especially small pieces of iron, whereas the cuttlefish provided a relatively inconsequential ingredient. Almost anything else could do the same job, for example, ox blood. Yet the halacha emphatically requires a specific creature, the chilazo. As it is stated, only chilaz from a chilazo is acceptable. From Herzog thus rejected Rebzin Tchilas, reasoning that it could not be authentic since the cuttlefish's contribution to the dye was simply incidental and non-essential. In the course of testing the Rebzin dye, Rav Herzog wrote to the leading scientist in his day who told him what all scientists before had known this fact. The great German chemist Paul Friedlander wrote, I also consider it impossible to produce a pure blue from the purple snails. And the chief scientist at the world-famous Goldwyn Institute in France wrote something even more dramatic. I don't know of any natural blue color other than indigo that is capable of solidly dyeing textile fibers. Indigo is a blue dye that comes from a plant and was well known to Gemara as the fraudulent trellis called Kala Ilan. Since Kala Ilan is virtually indistinguishable from genuine animal-based trellis, Chazal must resort to leveling severe curses upon those who try to pass off the cheaper plant-based indigo instead of real trellis. And so Rav Herzog was confused. On the one hand, he found the evidence from archaeology convincing that the murex trunculus was used for dyeing in the ancient world was an incontrovertible fact. He also respected the scientists who were telling him that the murex could only dye purple. But he was simply not willing to dismiss the deeply held Jewish tradition so emphatically stated in both Midrash as well as Allah that Tchelis was sky blue. Even though the topic was dear to Rav Herzog throughout his life, Rav Herzog died in 1959, with the mystery still in place. The Chilazon was most probably the Murex. The Murex snails have a purple color, and Chilazon is blue. To solve this dilemma, we will need to understand how the dyeing of Chilazon takes place. The first thing is to catch the snail. This is done in the exact same way as it was thousands of years ago. Baskets with pieces of fish as bait are lowered to the sea floor. Since the snails eat meat, within a few days the baskets will be filled with dozens of snails. This process is called Tzayda or trapping the snail, and it requires nets or baskets that are tied and untied, just as the Gemara and the Martian explain. The next step is to break open the shells and extract a small yellow gland on the back of the snail's body, which contains a secretion that will become the basis for the dye. The Gemara describes this process as Hatsad Chilazon Upotzon, one who traps the Chilazon and breaks it open. The removal of the gland must be done while the snail is alive, which is something mentioned both by the Gemara and ancient Roman writers, and it is true biochemically of the different snails. The glands are then smashed, and the bright yellow secretion quickly turns purple as it is exposed to air. That in turn is dried out and grinded into a powder, which can be stored for many years without spoiling. At this point, we can continue with the dyeing process. Okay, that's where I come in. So what we have here, the first thing that I need to do is I'm going to take as we saw, let me just review a little bit. Lights. The chilazon, the chilazon is what we believe to be the murex trunk. This is the snail. Obviously this is just the shell of the snail. Inside there's a worm that lives inside and that's where we get the gland. We have to break this open and we have to take the gland out. If we take the gland and dry it out and chop it up and put it in a coffee grinder, it gets very, very dry and powdery. And that is what, we get, what we're going to use now to start the dyeing process. When I dye with all of this, what I'm going to end up with is chayv. Right? Well, it's purple. Exactly. That's the problem that we're facing. How are we going to get around this problem? The answer was found really just a few years ago, maybe 40, 40 years ago, 90, 45 years ago, 1985. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take these and 
put these little uh, this uh, powdery glands. What we do is we take the uh, the glands out, we mush them in a food processor, then we put them on a hot plate, like a Shabbos hot plate, for a couple of days until they get nice and dry, and uh, then we take them and put them into um, a coffee grinder, and that's what we have here. And what I have here may be about 20, 30 snails. Wow. How many snails does it take to make a set of chayos? About 30. About 30. Bezrat Hashem, this year we're going to make 25,000 sets of chayos. How many snails is that? It's a lot of snails. Give or take, maybe about a million snails, just to be on the safe side. I'm adding a little bit of water. Yeah. On your um, smell, we'll talk about the smell in a second. Okay, so now let's look and see. We'll do this together with the Gemara. Amar Abayi Rav Shmuel Bar Yehuda. Gemara Menach. Hatachilta. Hechet Tzadik Chelu. Abayi says to Rav Shmuel Bar Yehuda, "How do you make chelus? Why doesn't Abayi know how to make chelus? Abayi was quite brilliant. How come he doesn't know how to make chelus? You have to ask Rav Shmuel Bar Yehuda." Mora, but it's not uh, the caliber of a bayin. Where do the snails live? In the Mediterranean. Where does a bayin live? In Boga. A bayin is a thousand miles from the closest snail. But Rosh Hashanah is what they call the Nechuta. He goes back and forth from Eretz to Boga. So he grabs a bayin, he grabs Rosh Hashanah when he comes from Eretz and he says, how do you over there in Eretz how do you make things? So what does a bayin, what does Rosh Hashanah say? What do we do? We take what do we take? So, my sin on dam chilazon. Okay, so the first thing we do is we take dam chilazon, which we believe is this gland, the secretion of the chilazon. This samani. That's a very important word. It means that you can't die tchela straight from the from the snake. You need samani. We need chemicals to be added. Why do you need chemicals to be added? Because if you look, what color here is my is my liquid? The, it's yellow, but it's nothing really. It's clear. Because the dye is not water soluble. It doesn't dissolve in water. What happens is it all precipitates down and you're left with nothing in the water. If I would take my wool now and put my wool into this water, I would get wet wool. I wouldn't get anything, any color coming out of this. What you need to do is you need to get the dye to be soluble in water, to be part of the whole mixture, and then you can put the wool in and you can get it to dye. Now, the fact that a dye doesn't bond to water, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Why is it a good thing? Then it won't get washed out. It won't out. get washed out. Chaylas, according to the Rambam, Omedet, the never fades, never washes out. There's nothing you can do to get rid of chaylas. So if it did dissolve in water, it would be a big problem. It would come out in the immediately in the um, in the wash. So we don't want that to happen. So what we're going to do now is we're going to add some chemicals. I'm not going to go through all of the different what each of these chemicals does. And I'll tell you why. It's because I don't have a lot of time. I could go through it. But the most important question that you have to ask is I'm going to be using chemicals. This chemical, by the way, is netter. What? Netter. It's called, it's on caustic soda. You call it Drano here in this country. It's, it's what was used in the times of the Gemara to, to, and even in the times of the, of, of, of the, of the Tanakh to, to, wa to wash out uh, different stains. So this particular chemical they had in the times of the Gemara. But the next chemical that I'm going to add, they didn't have in the times of the Gemara. So what did they do? Well, we believe that they did, and we don't have much, because all Rav Shmuel Bayuda gives us is a little information, some other chemical. I'll give you something, a little bit of a, a little bit of a lesson that I learned. If you're going to be writing a book that's going to be read a thousand years later, give more information, pictures, anything you can. The Gemara, unfortunately, doesn't tell us much. Luckily, there were others around the same time that give us more information. There's a scientist by the name of Pliny. <coughs> Pliny writes, he would take his snails and chop them up, put in a little salt, a little bit of wood ash, a little bit of stale urine, and leave it for about two weeks 
on the side to, uh, uh, to get to the point that we're going to get to. And what we need to get to is exactly this. Okay. So what we're going to get to now is this stage. And what I'm going to be using now is, again, the sodium dithionite. The Gemara doesn't know about sodium dithionite. It wasn't invented until a few, uh, maybe a few hundred years ago. But the Gemara's stale urine, or, uh, or, or, or the Roman stale urine, would have done the same thing. But it would have taken two weeks. I know that you've given me an hour of your time. I don't think two weeks would have been uh, something that I could have expected. But we have tried it. We have tried to do it this way with the wood ash, and with the thaw, and even with the stale urine, and uh, we were able to get to the same point. And this is the important point that I needed to get. Okay, now, now what do you see? That's in, that, what's the color that I have here? Green. Okay. This is already something is dissolved in the water. It's green, and it's something. <coughs> on the way, something is dissolved in the water. This needed to be achieved. Those first scientists in Crete, in the time of Avram Avinu, this is what they needed to figure out. They knew that the snail that they were eating could give you a purple stain on your mouth. Everybody knew that if you ate snail. But the difference was that it was a stain, it wasn't a dye. What's the difference between a stain and a dye? A stain washes out or comes out at some point or fades. A dye never does. They had to get to this stage of what we call chemically reduction in order for them to be able to now dye the wool. This would take, as I said, maybe two weeks, maybe more, but it's mm. difficult because too little and it's not ready, and it won't be neglect. It won't get into the wool. Too much, and it's going to get ruined. It was a fermentation. The bacteria on the meat would, would ferment this and turn it into what I've done now with just some chemicals. So that's the problem that the Gemara faces. And the Gemara now goes into a whole discussion of how, when, what do we do when we want to figure out if our treles is ready. And ready can mean a few things, but certainly it means if it's up to the point where you can put the wool into it. So the Gemara talks about the emo. I'm going to do that in a second, but I want to get this. I want to put this out in uh, in the Why? sun for, for just a moment. Why is this different than adding the samanim of the radzina? I'll tell you why. Because the samanim of the radziner would work with anything you put in, whether it's ox blood, fingernails, chopped liver, whatever you put in there, it would work. Anything organic. Anything organic, exactly right. Anything organic that has a little bit of carbon or a little bit of nitrogen would work. It would turn into blue. It would turn into blue. Our treles will work with a whole bunch of different chemical processes, as long as you have the chilos in there. And that's the big difference. What I'm doing here... Oh, that's for sure. The only thing that will be left there is a dye. I'm not going to get into the chemistry too much, but I'll tell you that. What I'm going to add now is what happened is I, I, I added a very strong base. I'm going to add a little bit of an acid now, and that's going to make it neutral so that I can add the uh, the wool so that the wool won't get won't get ruined. I don't know if anybody can smell it, but this is one of the worst smells in the world. <laughs> and that is part of the story. Because what happened in 1985 is that a chemist in Israel, a chemist in Eretz Yisrael started doing this. He got money to do some research into this. That's an interesting story of why he got money to do it. But he started doing this research, and he found that the smell was too difficult. He did exactly what I'm going to do now. He put it on the windowsill. Baruch Hashem, today we have sun. We haven't had it in a long time. But uh, now we're going to get some sun. And uh, we're going to see that the sun is going to change a lot of the things that happen and have been happening. I'm going to talk about the ima in a second. I didn't forget about it. So what I'm doing now is I'm putting this into a pot. I'm going to put it out in the sun for just a few seconds, and then I'm going to talk about the ima. Okay. The 
problem is like this. Gamar says, you have to, in order to check whether the trellis is ready, you're going to pour it into an eggshell. And you're going to dip some wool into the eggshell and test it. Te'ima doesn't mean with your mouth. That's not a good thing to do. So what happens is, you take this, put this into an eggshell, and in, instead of learning it in the Gemara, it's easier if we learn it straight from the Rambam. The Rambam says the same thing. Look at the Rambam. I think it's the third, third uh, source that I have. In a, in a minute, I'm going to put the wool in there. Everything that I've done up until now doesn't need kavana, doesn't need lishma. It could be done by a robot. It could be done by a non-Jew. And up until this point, everything is not important. Hatzviya, the minute that I put the wool into the yora, into the solution, from that moment on, I need lishma. In tzva, shelo lishma psula, the Rambam says. And what if I did it without kavana? Possible. Now here is where the Rambam redoes the Gemara. Does it even more clearly than the Gemara? Ayora sheyesh ba atzeva. In tzva ba me'atzem elevodko. Im hu yafeim lav nifsla hayora kula. If I put the wool into that solution, then I didn't have the right kavana. Why? What did I do? I'm not being tzoveya for the mitzvah of tchelas. I'm being tzoveya to see if the solution is ready. Why don't I know? Because it took two weeks and bacteria and fermentation and chemicals and all these other things. I don't know if I'm ready yet. So you would do te'ima along the way to see if you're ready to go. Okay. Ella So what are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to know if it's ready? So the Rambam here brings a kli katan. The Gemara says a kli shel beitza, which either way, in different times in history, that was the equivalent of a paper cup. So you could throw it out at it. So what we have now is I take a little bit off, I pour it a little bit off, and then I see, I bodek the tzemer, moneach bo tzemer, shebodek bo. Now, this is the key. So reifet shebadak, I have to now burn the tzemer that I used to test. Why? It's naive. Because why? Because this tzemer is going to look like tchelet, but it wasn't nitzvah l'shma. Shevadak sharei nitzvah l'vdika. So it's not kosher tchelet. You don't want it lying around, so you have to burn it. V'shofei ha-tzeva shepatchli, and you throw away the tzeva, the, 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 the solution, that's still in the kli. Why? Shevadak bo. Sharei tamo solo. Because I've dipped into it wool that was not lishma. So I was puzzled. I was puzzled the entire solution. That's the key that the Gemara speaks about. And then, Can you do to the Gemara lishma? Beautiful question. Hold on to that. Okay. So that's the Gemara. Now, we're not going to do the Te'ima because I think pretty much, for, you know, more or less, I kind of know what I'm doing. I've done it once or twice. So this is ready. And we don't have the same problems of the uh, bacteria and the fermentation and all the other things. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this wool. The color from the sun just changed. You can't see it, but inside, and this was, sorry, thank you. What happened in 1985 was this professor, Otto Elsa, when he put this out on the windowsill, and he started noticing that on cloudy days, he was indeed getting the purple. But on sunny days, he was getting blue. And what we can do now, hopefully, hopefully, never be sure of anything, but hopefully, at all, just that sunlight was enough to change what's going on in here. We can talk about later if you want to know what exactly was changed. We understand the processes very, very well now. What you'll get out of here now, if the sun worked, is something that is absolutely identical to Kala Ilan, which we, uh, which we saw was uh, was uh, uh, exactly identical to Tchelet, and this is what was missing. Remember, we for 200 years, people have been searching for Tchelet, and they've known about these stamps. The Radzina knew about these stamps. Teresh Yisrael writes about these stamps. The Herzog certainly knew about these stamps. But all they were able ever to get was purple. And so the Radzina had to go looking for something else and so on. Okay. To say that, from this moment on, the Shem is I'm going to do this with Shema. I'm going to put this in here. I'm going to leave it in for a few moments. 
let the seva, the dye, get into the. Okay, beautiful. Well, one of the main reasons that I came here was to share with you something that, absolutely, in my opinion, amazing. And that's the meal of the kohen This is a meal that's made kuluk. Not next week's parsha, the parsha after that. So we're almost in the parsha. What material is wool? This material is wool. Chaylet imrod, chaylet amrod, chaylet is made out of semen. Klil techaylet. The begad in the coin gold was made completely, completely out of techaylet. And Be'ezrat Hashem, Kodesh Baruch Hu, should be good to us. The coin gold will wear this me'il on one condition. That the coin gold is a spark. Because there's a big machlokas as to how the me'il is made. Giant machlokas between the Rambam and, the, and Rashi, I guess you would say. The Ramban pretty much comes down on the side of the Rambam. And Rashi and the Raivid are together on this. Did the me'il have sleeves? If you look at Rashi on the Pasuk about the me'il, he'll say, yes, it looks like, like a bathrobe. Right? That's the way Rashi's opinion is. The opinion of the Rambam is, no. The opinion of the Rambam is that you can see closely. This is actually the Ramban's opinion in the Rambam. The Rambam is not 100% clear, but what you can see is this looks like a poncho. Right? And this is the opinion of pretty much the Ramban. It's not 100% clear, but, uh, but the Svaradin pretty much will hold that this is the correct way that the meal is made. What are the purple You may have seen by accident. This was made, now let me just tell you about this. Remember I said Tchelos was worth up to 20 times its weight in gold? What you have here is 2.6 kilograms. 2,600 grams. 2,600 grams. Okay? This morning, gold went for about $40 a gram. So let's do the math together. 20 times its weight in gold. 2,600 times 20 times 40. I'll save you the trouble. It's about $2.5 million. The meal of the Kohen Godel would have been about two and a half million dollars. But just keep that in your in your mind for a second. Okay? So this is the meal. We'll talk more about it in a second. But I need to ask you a question. This is the beautiful, beautiful question of the Radvan. By the way, what's missing from the from the meal? The pomegranates. So yes, both are right. On the bottom there would have been of the meal, there would have been seventy-two. So our focus we passed in seventy-two. Pa'amonim v'rimonim. The pa'amonim and the rimonim, we have one here, which we didn't make them yet. We need to make 72 golden bells. And it's on the back. 72 golden bells and 72 pa'amonim and rimonim from Tolat, Shani, from red, from orange, from purple, uh, and these golden bells. Well, I guess we'll have to look for donations. We'll put a little donated vine on the bottom of every bell. <laughs> Is it woven in a special way also? It's woven. It has to be Mase Ariga. It's one of the begotten that has to be done, woven and not in macha. From Isha Chach Maslev. If I have time, I'll talk about the Isha Chach Maslev who made this incredible, beautiful meal. But that's the question of the Radvan. Yafet. Four corners. Why doesn't the meal have to see this? Radvan tries to give some answers. He says, well, maybe the way that, the, that, it, that it's made with a hole in the middle... Uh, maybe that doesn't count then as a four-cornered baguette. What? Oh, hold that in. Also. The other idea is also that some people bring down, the Ksav Kabbalah brings down, that the Pamonim and the Rimonim on the bottom would make a noise, right? And that noise was there to remind the Kohen Gadol all the time of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Just like it's this, this supposed to remind you all the time of Kodesh Baruch Hu. So, so the Sam Kabbalah says, maybe that, it didn't need sitzes because the bells, you know, you have Uriisim also, Uzchaitim is called Mishmat Hashem. So the meal, Ushmatim also, you could listen to it and it would remind you of all the, of all the mitzvahs of Hashem. Maybe, hold on to that question for a little while. I'm going to go back and forth between questions. Where are we? Here. Okay. Yeah, fair. Okay, I'm ready to take this out. Now, the opposite of the reduction is oxidation. And if I take the oxygen in the air, then slowly but surely this is going to turn into, into treles. 
if it was in the sun long enough. If it wasn't in the sun long enough, then it'll be Agamon. But I think that we're uh, okay today. We really had a good strong sun. So in a few seconds, we're just going to see. So you see that this turns into a modern medrash. Chaylus domel yam, yam domel rakia, rakia domel kisei akavod. So not only is chaylus domel yam, it comes from the sea. It needs the chilazon that lives in the sea. Not only is it domel rakia, but it needs the rakia, it needs the shemesh, it needs the sun that's in the rakia. You do with that what you want. Okay. I think that we're all going to agree that just a little bit of sun just a little bit of sun makes a big difference. This will get even a little bit darker. Well, what about Rashi says Yarok? Hard to understand. We don't know exactly what Yarok means to Rashi. Rashi's a Das Yachid. But uh, I, I, I don't know. Is it Next question. Turquoise. Very difficult question. Rashi's a Das Yachid. Rambam certainly says, Kitaro Shalarakia, in the middle of the day, the uh, Sajid Gon uses an Arabic word which means the color of the sky. And uh, pretty much all of the post can and all of the Mepharshim believe that Tchelis was supposed to remind you of the sky. So I think that you all believe that there's a difference between this and this. Okay. What's the Kobo War again? It's exactly, exactly the same thing that I did, except without putting it in the sun. Okay. I'm not done yet. Hold on. Now, now we're just getting started. <coughs> Now we're going to do the rest of the Gemara. The rest of the Gemara says that there's a machloket. Okay. Who was it that asked? What if I did the tzviya? What if I did the tzviya lishma? That question is precisely the question that's asked by the Rambam and especially by Tosfos. You see, when we read the Rambam. What was the reason that I couldn't do the dipping and I had to use the eggshell and I had to take it out? Because I did have a The Rambam starts off by saying, And all of what I said here is under that category of lishma. Comes along Tosos and says, we're going to be about three lines from the bottom of the Tosos that I have. He argues with Rashi. We'll see Rashi in just a second. But according to Tosos, right? If I dip inside this solution, I can dip a hundred times, as long as each time I dip lishma. That's the shita of Tosmos. That is the shita of the Rambam. And what we're going to do now is put another little piece of wool into this same solution. What's that called, according to the Gemara? Anybody know? It's a phrase you probably haven't come across. Marashim. Second, we'll talk more about that in just a moment. What I want to do is, I really, really want this to heat up a little bit. Okay, so let's see if we can do it this way. I'm going to dip this in again into the same solution. Filling it all over the floor as I follow. The shame is about sitsis, the whole thing is done with shma. I want to heat it up a little bit also. Okay. Now let's look at the Gemara here because the Gemara now has a very interesting machlok. The Gemara goes on to say, after everything that we learned from the Rambam, what do we learn? Sviya Lishma. Four lines from the bottom of the Gemara. Kitnai, machlokas tanoim. Te'ima psula, tasting or testing. The tzemer is pasul, mishum shenemar by the me'il. What does the, t- the pasuk tell us by the me'il? Kalil t'cheles. So how do you understand the words kalil t'cheles? Kulo t'cheles. Has to be all t'cheles. All t'cheles, says Rabbi Yochanina ben Gamliel, te'ima is pasul because it's a psul, in the idea of being all chaylas. Rabbi Yochanan ben Dehavai has a different pshita. Afilu marasheni shabakasha. Dipping it a second time in the same solution, that's what's called marasheni, that's awesome. That, excuse me, that's mutter. That's Rabbi Yochanan ben Dehavai. How do I know that it's mutter? Listen to this beautiful limud. Because later on in the parsha it says, Tolad shani. What's Torah Shani? No, there it is. 
Hashem Shad, Olat Shani, is the Shani, the red that comes from a worm. It comes from a crimson worm that lives up in the mountains of Lebanon. Olat Shani means Shani, red. So Rabbi Yochum ben Davai says, no, you could read it, Shani, second. So if you can do a second dipping on Olat Shani, on the red, so why shouldn't you be able to do it also on the Tchais? That's Rabbi Yochum ben Davai. Machok is Rabbi Yochum ben Davai. And Rabbi Yochum ben Davai. What is the last shiny referring to? Red. Crimson. Which mitzvah is that? We also use it in the Bogazim of the Kotel. For something else. For other things. Then the parochas, in a lot of different places, you'll use the last shiny, but that's a, a different thing that you're going to do. Okay. But from Kriv Tachelis, we learn mm-hmm. how to put mitzvahs. Exactly right. Now, according to Tosmo, according to the, uh, uh, the Rambam, so what we have here is going to be perfectly fine because I did it with Shema. And even, and even according to Rabbi Yochanan ben Zahavai, even according to Rabbi Yochanan ben Zahavai, there's certainly no problem with it. But there is one more shita. And that is the shita of Rashi. So if you look, on the side of the Gemara here, I brought down the shita. We need all of the tcheles. You should never dye anything else in that same pot that you did the tcheles. Nothing else. And so the Tosfo says straight out. He doesn't understand Rashi. He doesn't understand Rashi in the context of the Gemara because the whole Gemara was talking about the Shema. And all of a sudden Rashi is saying nothing else could be... Where does he get this from? That, that, that everything needs to be... All of the Kayak of the Chilazo needs to be in the... In, in, in the uh, doesn't understand it. So according to Rashi, only one dip, that's it? According to Rashi, only one dip, and that's it. Except, not everybody agrees with the way Tosmos learned Rashi. For a thousand years, everybody who learned this Gemara felt that there's a machlokas Rishonim. Rashi and the Rambam are holding on one side, which is that you uh, you have to have Rishma. But even a hundred times, if I put it in the same place, Rishma, it's fine. And Rashi argued with them, said, no, one time, that's it. That's what everybody believed was Machlokas Rishon. Until Rav Gershon Henech came along, Rav Gershon Henech said, Im kavod to all of the Rishonim and Achronim who have learned the Sugya this way, they learned it wrong. It doesn't make any sense. Why? So Rav Gershon Henech said, I'm the first person in a thousand years that actually died Tchelis. And I die my Tchelis with his squid. I die the Tchelis I dip it once, I take it out, and I get something which is blue. He had a different blue, whatever, but he got something that's different. I dip a second time, what comes out? I just dip this a second time in the same solution. So what do you expect is going to happen here now? Same color. Same color. This is Marishay. The second is going to change color to be exactly... Exactly. Doesn't get lighter? The same color. No. Once, twice. The Reb Zinner's dye was very, very, very powerful. He could die a hundred times. Our dye is not so powerful. You can die two, three, four times. But you're not going to see any difference. The Reb Zinner says there's no possible way that you can accept Rashi to mean that you can't die twice. Because why? it's going to come out exactly the same way. So Rashi had to be talking about a situation when you finally, after two or three or four or five times of dying, then you're starting to see that the dye is going to come out. The wool is going to come out much, much lighter. When it starts to get much lighter, this is the words of the resident. Look at what he said. I brought it down. Geshen Hedach says, what are you talking about, a chisaro? There's only one thing that can be chaser in, 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 in dying, and that's the color. 
וכשדבר אחר צבוע בה מתחיל לעשות נחלשות כוח הצבע. So what are we talking about Rashi? When the color starts to change. But בצבע חמה, he says, but with hot dye that I use, נראה בחוש, I see with my own two eyes, שאין המושך וקורא את הצבע בפעם הראשונה, ואפילו בפעם שנייה ושלישית, צובעת במראה יפה וחזוקה בפעם ראשונה. The first, second, third, ten, hundred dyes are all exactly the same. ולא הוכחה מראיוסה, and nothing has dimmed from its appearance. ואיך שייך רומא דלא אבי כליל דחלס. Can you tell the difference between these two? They're exactly the same. If I mix them up, you're not going to be able to see the difference between them. This is Marisha, and this is Marisha. They look exactly alike. If they look exactly alike, then they have to be kosher both of them. The only problem is Rishma. So you have to be Tzobar Rishma. That's a problem. That's the way Rav Gersh and Henoch learned the Sukya. That's the way the Radzina Hasidim today dye their Tcheles. They dip a number of times with the same with the same Sukya. That is a fantastic way to save money when you're dying Tcheles. And I wish that we could also do that. We don't do According to the sheet of Rashi, and according to the sheet of Rashi, not like the Razinah. But the Razinah is so powerful. Is there any other way that you can understand what Rashi is saying that it needs all the koach of the Chilazim? Tevger, who is the one who discovered our Chilaz, really the one who made the first, first Sittus with Chilaz in a thousand years, Tevger learns the Sugya differently. He learns Rashi differently. And he bases himself on a beautiful message. There's one other place in the Torah where it says Chil Chelos. You might remember? The covering of the Aram. <coughs> Later on, it's Bamidbar. The Levusha Aram. The covering of the Aram Kodesh. And there's a Medrash there that says, Ba'aro Nemar Chil Chelos. On the bottom, Bamidbar Ram. Mashalon Nemar Bechulam. All of the other coverings of the Mishbeach. Remember when they would travel, the Mishkan was traveling. When you had to travel, you didn't want the Aron Kodesh to be exposed to the sun, to the, uh, to the sand of the Midbar. So what did you do? You covered it. What did you cover it with? Some of the other things had Argaman, some of the other things had Tachash, they had seal skins or whatever that is. But the Aron was covered, Kliel Techeles, also in a covering of Techeles. Lama? Shemu Chashuv, Bikol Klei Mishkan. It's more important than all of the other Kalim in the base of Mishkan. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Follow the message. Shlosha Tarim He. There are three crowns. Keser Torah, Keser Kahuna, Keser Malchus. Okay. Say this. Malchus, Kahuna, Kimrocha, Yimrocha. The message is picking up on a very delicate idea. The word Kliel Tcheles, the word Kliel, Kliel, I've explained it to mean Kula all through and through. But Kliel could mean something else. Kliel teferes birosho natata. What does that mean there? A crown. Kliel teferes. That's what Rav Shimon is playing on in this medrash. Kliel techeles is malchus. It's the crown of malchus. If you're going to say that what you're talking about is malchus, and that the big day kahuna, especially the kliel techeles of the eel, has to represent Malchus. The Rebbe gets the first cup. The, 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 the Hasidim, they get the Shirai. The Rebbe doesn't get the Shirai. The Melech doesn't eat from leftovers. The Melech takes the first, Bikurim, Shem and Zayis, the first drop. That's what you give to the Melech and certainly to the Melech Malchem Lachem. If Tevger learns Rashi to mean, what does it mean you need all of the Chilozon in there? You need all of the Chilozon. And if you took some out because you tested it, that's not Malchus. That's not what the, that's not what HaKadosh Baruch Hu deserved. And so we're Machmir, that we only use Mare Rishon for our tzitzis, and not Mare Shemi based on this idea that it's Malchus. And if it's Malchus, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu deserved only the first cut the first drop, not tainted by anything else. Malchus. The eel represents Malchus. 
And this idea is, is true because, because the emperor of the Romans, at different times, there were edicts that said only the emperor of the Romans and his family were able to wear this, um, were able to wear the royal guards, right, that were made out of the shellfish. Both the Tleilas and the Argaman, but at different times there were edicts. Justinian, the, uh, the emperor of Rome, says anybody who even owns Tleilas and Argaman, he calls it Oxyprada and Hyacinthina. Hyacinthina is the Targum Ashivim into Greek for the word Tleilas. Anybody who owns it in their house, that's a crime tantamount to treason, punishable by death. By death. So, who was allowed to wear the Tleilas and Argaman? Only the king and the king's family. The same is true with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu also wears tcheles. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wears tefillin. HaKadosh Baruch Hu also wears talis. What's the talis kavyafal that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wears? What do we say when we put on our talis? Otei or kesalma Otei shamayim kiyuriyah the Shamayim, Kumo Tcheles, Akash Borchus Tavis. And uh, part of the royal entourage, the Kohen Godot wears a Me'il, which is Kulo Tcheles. The Kohen Hedjot wears an Avne, which is made out of Tcheles itself. And every Jew wears a little strand of Tzitzit. Why? Rabbi Shimon Omer, Tony Throb, B'nai Mulachim. Right? We're all B'nai Mulachim. We're all part of the royal entourage. We're all part of the Malchus Shamayim, Mamish, the Malchus Shamayim. And there's actually a medrash that says this beautifully, and, and actually we learn a minam, halacha lamaisa from this medrash. Medrash says that in Echa Rabbah, Amar of Nachman of Shmuel, Mishum Rabbi Yishu ben Leib, Kara HaKadosh Baruch Hu Malachi Ashare, Samar Lehen, HaKadosh Baruch Hu at the time of the Korban, calls all of the angels together and he says, Melech basav adam kishemeis lo meis vehu misabel ma dar korazo. When a regular king, basav adam, is in Avelos, what does he do? One of the things that it says is he takes and he tears his cloth. Mivazea porfira shelo. Porfira, the Kohen, the, 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 the emperor, wears this purple or blue it was all called Porfira. That's still, by the way, the name of this snail today in Greek. Porfiro, Porfiros, all of this, the purple that comes out is also called Porfira. So the Gemara calls, by the way, the Rushalmi, when we learned a couple of uh, weeks ago, Dafyomi, right? Kishemakir, Kishiyakir ben Tcheles Lekarti, the Rushalmi there says on the word Tcheles, it calls it Porfiri. So porphyrin is the word for tcheles. It's a gemara that Yerushalmi used to, that used to be used. The Greek word for tcheles, right? Hakadosh Baruch Hu is mevatzea. He tears his cloak of tcheles. How do you know that? This is his psukim that I can quote. Avish shamayim kidru misak asim ksuta mishay. Avish shamayim kidru. I will. Dawn, or I will, I will clothe, clothe the heavens, the shamayim, in darkness. And mevazea pufira kachani oseh says Hakadosh Baruch Hu because of the the, the pasuk in Eicha, also Hashem 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 zamam bitsa emros. He cut his word emros in emros in what? Cut his word. But two beautiful puns that the medrash is doing. When he says, I'll be Shamayim Kidrus, I'll make the sky dark. So I cut a Shabbat Talis of the sky. I'm going to make dark. And I'm going to take it, I'm going to take it off, but I'm not going to wear it. And Bitzea Em Russell, when I rip my word, that's what a Kodesh Baruch Hu is saying, right? Chedas Amra. Imra is the Aramaic word for Tzemer. Tzemer, Chedas and Tzemer, they all go together. So the this beautiful pun that the mission that, 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 that or what's learning out, what the Medrash is learning out, is that Akash Baruch Hu in the time of the Korban took off his talus. His talus is the sky, his talus is Kulot, Cheles. What halacha do we learn out of that? Brought down halacha 
We don't wear a talis on Tisha B'Av because of this message. The morning. We also take off our talis. And that's a beautiful, beautiful idea. But the idea on that follow me. Here's the problem. Based on this, many people believe that Chelas was lost during the time of the Churban. We know that that's not the case. I quoted a Gemara before that 500 years after the Churban, there's still Chelas. But this is a problem. Because if Chelas, people are saying, is lost in the Churban, by a shame. So what's going on here? Then how come 500 years later you're wearing Chelas? And not only that, but there's an Ariza that talks about the fact that Chelas was hidden till the times of, uh, of Mashiach. Why? Because of the Chorban the Beis HaMikdash. This is a difficult problem, and many people feel that you shouldn't wear Tcheles today based on this Ariza. There are many, many people who feel that you need to take this Halakha Lebaisa. Rabbi also said that as a history thing or as a spiritual thing that has to be right? I don't know if you can tell me this. I don't, I don't know if I can. I certainly am not somebody who can understand the Ariza. It's not brought down by Rabbi Chaim Vital. And what people tell me, but believe me, I'm not Bucky, is that if, if something is not brought down by Rabbi Chaim Vital, then it's not Halakha, that you learn from the Ariza. But still, the Ariza is an interesting question. So, not only that, but I'll tell you something else. You see, the um, there's something else that, that I want to from uh, from Halberstam. From Halberstam brought down a very very beautiful idea. Halberstam from Lakewood. He quoted a message which says that. Uh, one time I was walking from Achzim in the north of Israel to Tzor, which was also northern, uh, uh, southern Lebanon. And I asked a Zakein, you know, what do you do? What are you on the beach? What are you doing on the beach? What do you do for a living? I catch chilzon. Is it really here? Yeah, he swore. There's some place that you have to go to, an island between the, between the sea and the mountain. But you have to be very, very careful. Why? Because there are these poisonous spiders, and they could catch you, and if they bite you, you'll die in a minute. Hard panasa, I'll tell you that. That's what you got to do. But it's difficult to understand what this Medrash is. Rav, uh, Rav Halberstam said, in order to understand this Medrash, you have to see there's another Medrash where the Oive Yisrael are called Samomia, the same exactly poisonous kind of creature. The saying is, what's happening? This is my Parnas, I got to go catch the Chilazon. But as we've seen before, the Romans made an edict that anybody who goes to catch these Chilazon, and anybody who deals with them is going to be killed. So I have to be very careful, says the fisherman to Rabbi Yosef. Because the Malchus of Edom wanted and wants the purple and the tcheles. And that comes into a problem with Malchus. Hold on to this for a second because I want to go back to your question. Our Me'il. Four corners. Why does the Me'il have this? I have an idea. It's based both on the idea that Rabbi Yaakov Meidan from Eretz Yisrael once said, but also on the Minchas Chinuch's answer to the Radvan. You, who is it to say? Talis Shikul Where do you have that? What's the Medrash? Moshe Rabbeinu and Korach. Korach says, I don't understand. If I have a Talis Shikul it should be Chayv and Tzitzis, right? Why isn't it Chayv and Tzitzis? So what he's talking about here is the Me'il. The Me'il comes to Moshe Rabbeinu, Korach comes to Moshe Rabbeinu and says, listen, if you hold by the Rambam, and you hold by the Rambam, the Me'il is going to have four corners. Why doesn't the Me'il have tzitzis? says in I'll tell you two with a story. I read this story recently, probably know it. The Yisrael Friedman Roshi was very, very much the Roshi. The Jinnah Hasidim, not Rabbi Roshi. The Jinnah Hasidim were very, very involved in the idea of Malchus in this world. Right? And they were known, Shaw uh, uh, Friedman of Rishin was known to have extravagant palace that he lived in, 
beautiful clothes, carriages, and especially he wore golden boots that had diamonds studded in them. One time, Kiddush Kovana, must have been in the middle of, uh, of, uh, the, of the winter, the Hasidim and, uh, and the Rajina Rebbe are outside. And the Rajina comes out inside after Kiddush Kovana. Hasidim noticed on the snow where he was standing, it's all blood stained. They come over to the Rebbe, what's going on? He takes off his diamond studded golden boots and he shows them there's no soul. He's basically barefoot. The covering was made out of gold and diamond. He said to them, when I'm talking about Malchus, you think I'm talking about me? You think it's about me? That this is for my cover? This is for HaKadosh Baruch Hu's cover. The Malchus that we're talking about is Malchus Shemayim. Minchas Chinuch says like this. A talis she'ura if you borrow somebody else's talis, what's the halacha? It's not chayv and tzitzis. When the pasuk comes along and says, Moshe said, Kadosh Baruch said to Moshe, "Ve'asisa begadim la'aron achicha lechabal litefaret for beauty and for splendor, for honor, for glory and for splendor. Whose kavod and whose sferet do we talk about?" Korach says, I want to have that meal. I want to have a tal with shikul otcheles. I want the kavod. I want the tzeret. If that's the case, then whose talis is it? Korach. But if it's Korach's talis, it's not a tal with shikul. It's chayv and tzitzis. Right? But if the kavod and tzeret is a matodish baruch then whose begadim is it? Sparkles. So the home eel is not yours, it's not, it belongs to the coin. It doesn't belong to the coin bundle. It belongs to the Sparkle, and therefore it should be kind and simple. That idea of who's covered and who's spare, who does the Malchus belong to? I believe that you have that in Sittis as well. And I think that this is an idea that was brought down by Rav Fast, that there are two aspects of where Sittis with Tchelis. There's the Nikla, if you want, maybe, and the Nistar, but they're both there. They're both important. Urisim also is in the Komis Vos Hashem. You wear the Tcheles, the Tcheles is expensive, the Tcheles is blue, it reminds you of the Shamayim, it reminds you of Kisei HaKavod, it would remind you of the Me'il, it would remind you of the things that you could only have in your head if you were thinking about different Kedusha, it would remind you of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But it also symbolizes Malchus also symbolizes malchus. But there's a pagan. There's something missing from that malchus when there's no base on the church. And I believe that that may be the machlokas between Rabbi Yochanan ben Da'avai and Rabbi Hanina ben Gabriel. Look back and remember what it was. What's that very, very, very strange idea that Rabbi Yochanan ben Da'avai says? How do I know that Marashani is mutter? Because it says Torah Shani. Because Torah, don't call it Torah Shani, it's called Torah Shani. And just like by the crimson, you can have a second difference also by, by Tchelet. It's a very, very, very strange meaning. Rabbi Yochanan ben Davai lived and Rabbi Hanina ben Gamliel. This is the second generation after the Korban. Their parents, and maybe Rabbi Yochanan ben Davai was a little older, he may have actually seen the Beis HaMikdash. And I believe that what he's saying is this. I agree with you, Rabbi Hanina ben Gamliel. If everything was wonderful and perfect, we should only be having Marashani. Because there's two problems with Marashani. One is Lishma. We'll fix that problem. We'll dip a hundred times Lishma. We don't have that problem. But the other problem, if Temgur is right, in the way he understands the Limud in Rashi, Khalil Tchelas is the Keter of Malchus. That you need to have the only the first dip. Only that. But that aspect is Malchus. But there's no base on Mikdash. There's a Pagam in the Malchus of HaKadosh Baruch on this world. Yeshaya calls Hester Pani. He has a phrase for the Jewish people during times of Hester Pani. You know what that is? Kolat Yisrael. In times when the Malchus of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is hidden in this world, Am Yisrael, the Jewish people, are referred to as Tolat. And maybe where B'chanina 
what, what Rav Yochan ben Davai is saying to Chanina is, in regular times, when we have Malchus in this world, yeah, I'm going to agree with you that Marashemi is possible. But to last, when we have Hester upon him, then shame. Then the issue of Malchus is not important, and the only problem we have is Gishma. We'll fix that problem. And I just want to end with one last idea. Mordechai, a couple of weeks, right? We'll be reading in the Megillah, Mordechai walks out in Levush Malchus, and Tcheles is Malchus. I don't have to tell you that if you ask the Mekubalim, the Ramak, right, Pardes Ramonim, when he talks in Shara Gvonim, he talks about the color of each of the spheros. Guess what the color of the sphere of Malchus is? Malchus and Tcheles are associated with each other. Mordechai to the Kapala. I want to leave you with one idea. Satvar wrote, by all motion. It says, Shoshanas Yaakov, Sahala Bissamecha, Birosam Yachad, Tcheles Mordechai. Why were the Jews so happy when they saw the Tcheles Mordechai? They just had this amazing, uh, amazing victory and he saw them on all of their enemies. Their enemies now are downtrodden, they're killed. Isn't that enough to be happy? But it was only when they saw the Tcheles Mordechai that they were truly, truly happy. And I think this is the idea that he's getting at, although he says it in a little bit of a different way, he says it, that Tcheles represents the Atchalt of the Kibula. When the Jews in Persia saw, what, when they were saved, that's very, very wonderful. <laughs> but just like they were saved today, tomorrow somebody else could come along and jump in and, 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 and decide to hurt them. And what, and what are they going to do? Maybe it won't be a miracle the next time. But if this is the beginning of the process of coming back to Eretz Yisrael and Shivat Zion, if this is the beginning of the process of Geula, then they're truly, truly happy. And when they saw Mordechai wearing Tzcheles, <coughs> like the Kohen Gadol and the Me'il, and this is what I believe is meant, they saw that Malchus was being restored, and if Malchus is being restored, then we really have nothing to worry about, not just from this particular problem that the Jews faced, but from all the problems that the Jews faced. This is the beginning of the Geula, the beginning of the redemption. I, lo navi velo ben I don't know what the world holds. I, like everybody here, every single day, is parallel, and Kodesh Baruch should bring the Shia. I live in Eretz Yisrael. Maybe I'm one or two steps closer when the Shiach does come. But we're all davening for the Shiach. And if it's true that part of the bringing of Mashiach is the rediscovery of Tcheles, the bringing back Malchus to Am Yisrael, then whether you decide you want to wear Tcheles, whether you don't want to wear Tcheles, that's a big machlokes. It's a big, it's a big argument, and I don't want to trivialize it. Many, many, many big rabbanim, good, strong, strong Talmudic Chacham and Poskei Gedolei Ador are starting to wear Tcheles now and have been wearing it. Many don't. It's a very, very, very big and difficult argument and discussion. But what I think that we should all be excited about is that if it's true that we have found the real Tcheles, then it means something. If you wear it, you don't wear it. It means that Tcheles is once again here. And if it's once again here, then Bezrat Hashem, the Kohen Gadol really will be able to wear our Tzeles, which I just want to say for all of you people who were worried, this is my shame. <laughs> we didn't spend two and a half million dollars on this meal. We only used the Marashani that we used when, uh, when uh, we had the second dip from, uh, from the Tzeles. Why do we do that? Strange. But the Pesach Halacha is, can you add, that Marashani <coughs> is, is mutter for for Big Day Kuna, Rav Ariel from Akon Vesach, that we hold so. And we felt that we could rely on the Rambam and Toshvot to make the Me'il better, that we should make the Me'il for the Kohen Gadol, and he'll come to us and he'll say, oh, no, I only want Mara Rishon. Then if it was the other way, when we spent two and a half million dollars, and he would come and say, ah, oh, Chava, I would have been <laughs> perfectly happy with Mara Shein. But that, Bezrat Hashem, and with one, one last quote, I had, I found an absolutely beautiful puzzle. Well, I think you cannot wear this without tzitzit, right? He should. Sure? No, no. How do you know this? Ah, so that's a long conversation. I, I know about gold kind of colors. Ah, 
today. I know about two. There are dinner trailers and, and our trailers. But I just want to finish with one idea. In another month, we'll go outside and we'll make a, a bracha on the, on the Ilanos, right? The Sephardim call the pastor when they make that bracha. Ayomahu, when Mashiach comes, Yetzemach Hashem with Tzvi this Botkin Yishai. Yetzemach Hashem with Tzvi Lechavod. The Priya Ares will go on with Tzveret to play Tatisra. That the true Kavod and Tzveret of the Big Day Tehuna, the Kavod and the Tzveret, will come back when Mashiach comes with the Megil, Big Day Tehuna, with everybody, everybody wearing Tchelos on their tzitzis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.